Good evening all and welcome. Tonight we're going to be delving into the paranormal. And I'd like to take the opportunity to wish Alex, who's turning six today, a very happy birthday. I hope you've had a wonderful day. But for now, it's time for you to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. When I was a kid, I had an imaginary friend that was a dog. His name was Skippy, and he went with me everywhere. My mum said when she asked me who Skippy was, thinking it was another kid or imaginary friend, and I told her it was my dog. She asked where he came from, and I told her he came with me, and he's always been with me. I still have the stuffed animal that I felt represented him best. He's a little brown dog with a red bow and brown black eyes. Right now he's in storage since I'm about to move. Sorry Skippy, and I don't want to lose him. So that doesn't get at all weird, but there's more. There's the others too. One of the earliest people I remember was the dancing lady. I don't remember this entirely, only the story being told. My mother was cooking at the stove and to the left of the stove, we had some steps that lead to the stairs that go upstairs to the second floor. I was between two or three years old, sitting and watching her cook. She went to the oven, and then I cried out, Mom, look out! And she's confused and goes, Look out for what? And I reply back, The dancing lady, can't you see her? She's right behind you. Years later, my friend Molly is staying the night, and we're all being teenage girls playing on the computer and hanging out before we go to bed. At some point in the night, she went downstairs to get a drink or snacks, and I guess she saw the dancing lady. The next morning we wake up, and she starts asking the history of the house, and telling me she saw a lady dancing in the kitchen, and I'm like, Molly, are you serious? And I shared the story of when I was a kid. We were both seriously freaked out after that. There was also another younger girl. I never learnt her name or what she did, but I always felt her presence in the house. Like you know when someone walks behind you and you feel their energy. Okay, someone's behind me. I gotta make sure not to step backwards into them. That's how it always felt when she was around. I noticed this when I was around nine or 10 and always knew she was around up until I was 15 or 16 or maybe a little older. I think there was a man too, an older man, tall, always wearing black. He had such an awful energy to him, always angry. I don't like thinking about him. Late at night, there would be knocks on my bedroom door, which I would assume was the house settling, which was up on the second floor. There would be this noise like nails dragging on a wall. It was such an awful sound. My bedroom was parallel with the wall that led to the bathroom. And I wish it was my older brother, but when I heard these noises and knocking, it was late at night. My brother at the time was working the third shift, and I was 14 to 15 when this was going on. My last experience is the most vivid too. This was when I was about two, and I was first able to get up the stairs. I remember the gate was down, the baby gate, as mum didn't want me falling down the stairs. But I didn't care because I loved those stairs, and I was hearing noises coming from mum's room, which was the master bedroom, and it was sort of shaped like a square peanut, wide and long. To the left, when you entered, was a smaller square, where there were some storage closets built into the walls. To the right, there was the bed and dresser, and there were the windows that led out to the roof where I liked to sit. So I crawl up the stairs with my dog, Daisy, to investigate, because I'm a baby, and I have the balls to get up there, through the doors, and there inside is a group of nine men playing cards and smoking cigars. I remember their faces and how they looked so vividly. Most wore these derby hats and were dressed like in black and brown suits and vests very dapper looking men for sure. And they were laughing and talking and making bets, just having a good old time. I don't remember much after that. And I'd love to think it was my overactive imagination. 
but it just feels so real. It was so vivid. The smell of cigar smoke, the chatter and laughter, the feel of the stairs on my hands, and my dog whose hair stood on end the whole time. Daisy was a real dog. She was my best friend as a kid, but not Skippy. She was a black lab with the sweetest brown eyes, chunky and shaggy. I loved her so much. I like to think she was sort of being protective, like a second month of me, but a dog. Here's a little background about the house I grew up in. It was built in 1920 to 24, originally had two stories and later had some additions built on, like a back porch and the side office room. And the house next door may have been connected to my house on the same property. The house next door was a brothel, and I know this because each bedroom had its own bathroom, and the living room was sort of split off. The front entrance was smaller, and then you went through the double doors into the huge living room. The kitchen was tiny, and it had a little second room just behind it. I loved that house. My dad's friend Terry owned it, and she was such a big influence in my life growing up. We would go to the beach together, and I'd sleep over at her house, and she was like an aunt to me. I haven't heard from her in years, but I'd love to know how she is. Her house was huge, and I loved it, and was built just before my house was, and is a historical property in the area. My house also has a marker in front of it. Anyway, there's a rumor that someone ended their life in that house. Not like the people before us, but the ones before that. They said it was the stepmom of the guy who lived there. I never encountered anything like that, but I've hated my childhood house since I'm an adult. Maybe not hate, maybe just really don't want to ever go back there. A couple of summers ago, myself and some friends from university went to visit one of our friend's houses, since we were going to a festival nearby and had been offered to stay over. Long story short, her family are extremely rich, with a huge old mansion in the English countryside. As with any home this big, we had a bit of a tour around it, and were shown our guest rooms. Her dad began to tell us the place was haunted, in a joking tone, and mentioned that when they first moved in, there was a dresser that had been left behind in one of the guest rooms. The one I was staying in. This was one of the only things left behind, and they'd found a lock of hair of one of the drawers. I'm not really a believer in ghost stories, so at the time I just shrugged it off as a joke, although it's still a bit weird, admittedly. That night I got into bed and began to notice that the air felt strangely cold around me, but there wasn't a particular breeze. The rest of the house had been a perfectly normal temperature just before this too. As I slept, I kept having the most surreal dreams, nothing like when I'd sleep normally. I'd constantly awaken feeling cold. It was like when you're very unwell and you find yourself somewhat hallucinating in bed while you dip in and out of sleep. The other weird thing was that this is in the middle of August and in the UK, we don't typically have air conditioning unless you're in an office or something. I woke up next morning and on one side of the room, there are two hanging rails for clothes. Several of the clothes items were on the floor the hangers had completely come off the rails, and I could have sworn they were all hung up the night before. Like I said, I'm not a believer of paranormal, but that night has spooked me ever since. I've never experienced anything quite as strange, and I do wonder if her dad's stories of it being haunted had planted a placebo in my head. This takes place 12 years ago. I was 12 years old, and my gifts were starting to happen. My aunt and cousin had stopped by to stay for the weekend. It was a Friday. The day was normal, nothing strange about it. My cousin and I just hang out for the day. My cousin and I had to share a room, and her bed was against one wall, and mine was located at the wall on the other end of the room. Hers was by the door, and mine was against a wall at the other end of the room. That night, we both went to sleep as normal. As I was sleeping, I felt someone staring at me, so I woke up. I pulled the covers off me and sat up. Standing at the end of my bed was a little girl around seven or eight years old. 
Just a reminder, my cousin and I were 12 going on 13. She had blonde hair, blue eyes, and was wearing this bright, heavenly looking dress. She was looking at my cousin at first, who was still sleeping in her bed, snoring. Then she turned to me, smiled. It was a huge, happy smile, beautiful white teeth with no stains. She reached out her hand, and at this point, I stood up and ran out the room, yelling for my grandmother. Nana, there's a strange little girl in my room. My Nana gets up and comes with me to the room. She was gone. My cousin was still snoring in her bed, so my Nana said to me, Matthew, you probably had a dream. I then explained, No, Nana, I was wide awake. She even reached out to me. She then said, Don't you think about it anymore, honey. Just go back to sleep and forget it ever happened. So I did. For years I lived, thinking it may have just been a dream. Fast forward five years. I was 17. I was told that the landlord who owned the house had lived there with his daughters. One daughter was a twin, and they had passed away when they were about seven years old in the house. The house is located next to a highway, and one day the twin was playing outside with a ball that bounced into the road. As she went after it, someone had decided to start speeding around the corner, and sadly, hit the twin as she went out to get the ball. I still didn't think much more of my experience as more than a dream until one day. I went to the landlord's house to walk his dog back there, like I had hundreds of times. But this time he let me into his house and look around his antiques, as I have this strange obsession with antiques. I was looking at his family photos when one caught my eye. The picture was of the twins, taken just months before the twin had been killed. It was a little girl I had seen five years prior. Blonde hair, blue eyes, same big smile. At that point, I connected the pieces and have come to terms with my sighting. I saw her. I saw the little girl. She appeared to me and I don't know why. Now I need to add some minor details here. My cousin and I both have brown hair. I have hazel eyes, she has brown eyes. And one day, Soon after my visitation, I was going after something in the same road. And as I did, I heard a little girl yell my name, and I was the only one home. So I turned around and replied before stepping into the road. And as I did, a speeding car went by, and it would have hit me had I stepped out. The next experience I had was when I was 10. I moved into my grandmother's house. Some family problems were going on, and it was decided that I would go live with them. Nothing out of the ordinary my first year there, but that soon changed. My first experience with something strange happened when I was 11. It was a regular night, nothing out of the ordinary. I was sitting down at the table with my Nana, playing checkers and having a good chat. Suddenly, we heard someone running through the hallway. My Nana did not seem to react at all, so I decided to get up and investigate. She told me to leave it be, but I was a kid and full of curiosity. It was dark, no lights on, and I did not think to turn any on. As I approached the hallway, I heard the footsteps stop. Then they suddenly started to run towards me, not at an extremely quick pace, so fast I couldn't react. Just as they reached me, they stopped, and no one was there. I walked away scared and unsure of what I experienced. As I was walking away, I turned to look back, and that's when I saw a bright light flash, followed by a large orb appearing. It zoomed back into the hallway and vanished. I never told my Nana out of fear of not being believed. My next experience happened a few weeks later. I was playing outside alone, my back started to burn an itch, so I went inside and asked my Nana to look at my back. She suddenly asks me, What did you do to your back? I told her I hadn't done anything. I'd not laid on my back or put my back against anything. It just started burning. My back was covered in scratches, all over, about 13 in total, and they looked like nails had scratched me. The next experiences happened over a period of time. The first one is of multiple experiences that happened on a night like any other. 
It was just my Nana and I living in the house. It was about nine at night, when we suddenly heard people working and talking in the basement. Loud bangs, the sounds of shovels digging up the floor, and the sounds of the floor being hit by something suddenly filled the house. I got scared and asked my Nana about it, and she told me it was the ghosts working in the basement. I got the courage to look. I turned the light on and opened the door, fully expecting to see someone standing there. There was nothing. No one. The sound stopped completely, and I decided to go down and look. Nothing was touched, nothing was moved, and no one was down there. As I went to shut the door, I heard someone yell to me, let us work in peace. I quickly shut the door and walked away. Then the sound started up again. Fast forward two years later, and in the middle of the day, it started again. Same thing, no one was there. Fast forward four years from there, my Nana passed away, and my mum and I moved into the house. I had a friend over, and we were in the living room directly above the basement, when suddenly, the sound started up again. The floors started to shake, and the loud bangs and talking could be heard throughout the entire house. My mum comes in and asks what the sounds are, and without skipping a beat, I tell her to let the spirits work in peace, and to leave them alone. This last one is my final experience. This next story takes place over a period of eight years. Some backstory. The first part of this house was constructed in the 1850s and was a farmhouse. The next part of the house was constructed in the 1980s, when the landlord I knew who owned it decided to add it on for his wife who had fallen in love with the house. So because of this, the house had two attics. One required a rung ladder to climb into, and had no floor, just a series of boards about six feet apart from each other, and was mainly used as an insulation attic. The other was your usual attic, with stairs that led into two big rooms. While the attic with stairs we'll call Attic 1, and the one without stairs and a floor we will call Attic 2. Whenever I was told I had to go into Attic 1, I always had a bad feeling and dread overtook me every time I went. I found myself struggling to go into the attic because of these feelings. Well, every time I'd go in there, I'd hear someone breathing from whichever room would be opposite from me. Regardless of the day or time, it would always scare me. Goosebumps, cold chills, and the breathing would always happen every time I went into the attic, which made it rather difficult to have to go there from time to time. One day, I was asked by my Nana to go up and look for something. She told me exactly where it would be. It was in room two in a box, up on the furthest corner to the right. So essentially the deepest you could get into the attic. I said okay, even though fear immediately struck me. I was not a scared child, Fear was not a part of me until I moved into this house. So I opened the attic door and thought I heard someone take a step at the top of the attic, like someone had just finished walking up the stairs. So I paused for a moment, took a deep breath and proceeded to start up the stairs. As I was going up, I could hear whoever walking towards where I would be going, which terrified me, but I proceeded anyway. When I got to the top of the stairs, a shadow quickly went by the doorway I would be walking into. So I looked to my left and lying on a pile of boxes was an old baseball bat. So I grabbed it, at least to help me relieve my slight fear. As I started creeping towards the doorway, I could hear breathing coming from the room I was in. As I stepped into the room, it stopped. No one and nothing was there but I knew I had seen and heard someone up there. It's impossible to hide in this attic because it had no real corners or any place someone could successfully hide in. So I continued to the corner to grab the item and after some digging, I found it. So I quickly walked back to the top of the stairs and as I started down them, I decided to look back towards the room I was in and saw a shadow standing there. I jumped down the rest of the stairs, shut and locked the door quickly and gave my Nana the item she had asked for. She asked me 
what happened, and all I could say was nothing. Now I'm going to make the rest of Attic One's experiences quick because all of them were like that. Every single time I would go into that attic over the next few years, I'd hear the heavy breathing, watching things move completely by themselves with no possible way for it to happen, and occasionally see more shadows moving by themselves. We would occasionally hear someone walking up there, but never chose to investigate it because we already knew what it was. Now on to Attic 2. This attic. There are no words to describe this attic. When I asked my nana about this attic one day, she told me to never open the door. Upon asking why, all she said was, Matthew, there's something evil up there. Something so dark and angry it should never be released. So I said, okay, and never asked about it again, because I could see the terror in her eyes and nothing ever scared her. One morning as I awoke from a heavy sleep and started to get onto my PlayStation 2, I heard someone walking up there. Four extremely heavy footsteps, which would be impossible because there was no floor to walk on, and with the force of these steps, the boards would have not have been able to support it. So I decided to wake my Nana and tell her about it, but they had stopped by the time she awoke. So she went back to sleep. This took place when I was 12. A short time later, I was outside throwing a ball against the side of the house where the window to that attic was located. I threw too high and ended up breaking the window. So my grandfather had to get a new window and go up there to fix it. My Nana was furious because she never wanted that attic door to be opened. This is where the activity in the house started to ramp up. A few years later, I was 14 and started to act rebellious against the ghosts in the house and started to say and do whatever I could to get them going. Like an idiot, I'll admit it, but I did not know any better. My bedroom door was located almost just underneath the doorway to Attic 2 and one night I decided to do my best to get them going. So I said, if you were truly real, you wouldn't be scared to make yourselves known. Big mistake. A moment later, I saw a shadow standing outside my doorway, underneath the attic two door. And then I heard it say in a loud, old and stern voice, No. And it quickly disappeared. Now, listeners, there is still one more part to go in my time in Hell House but I'm going to leave this one on a lighter note. As I grew up in the house, I would at random times smell the strong scent of either cinnamon or roses. I would always go tell my Nana when it happened, and it would never be in the same part of the house, and it was never at a certain time. It was always, and completely, random. When I asked my Nana about it, she told me that our landlord's ex-wife, who passed away in the house, loved the smell of cinnamon and roses. She also told me that when I smelt one, that it was either her warning that either something good or bad was going to happen. When we smelt cinnamon randomly without any sauce, something bad was going to happen and vice versa. As an example, one day my cousin, who I mentioned in the story about the little girl, smelt cinnamon at the top of the stairs one day. She went outside to play, that day like any other, but after a while she ran into the house screaming. At one point she had fallen and landed on a corn plant stump, and part of it had gone up her nose. She was quickly taken to hospital. One time when I was 12, I'd smelt cinnamon strongly in the doll room, and later on that night, I had fallen on a trash bag after getting scared by my mum's ex-husband and sliced my foot wide open from something sharp in the bag. Another time after my grandmother had passed, I smelt roses in one of the rooms, and later on that day I got a promotion and raise at work. That isn't all that she would do though. Before the doll room had become such, it was just another living room with a TV, and was where my nana would sit and watch TV and rest. But every so often out of the corner of her eye, she would see a full body silhouette that was pure white quickly dash from the beginning of the room into the hallway. 
and it scared my Nana so much that she turned that room into the doll room where she stored all her dolls and moved her living room stuff to another part of the house. One day, when I was sitting in the doll room looking and studying all the antiques and other collectibles, I too saw this white silhouette dash from the beginning of the room to the hallway. After that, I did everything I could to avoid going into that room again. I hope you enjoyed the stories. Every bit of them is true, and it made my life growing up hard, because I always felt like I was being watched in that house. For the past few months, my three-year-old daughter has had an imaginary friend named Callie. I would have pretend tea parties where Callie would join us. I would pretend push Callie on the swing in our backyard, and Callie would help us colour. I figured this was absolutely normal behaviour for an only child of her age. While my daughter started preschool this month, the first day we came into class and met the teachers and mingled with the other parents, got a tour and the normal stuff. After the tour, it was time for the kiddos to play on the playground. My daughter was sprinting around full force with another girl having a blast. They ran up to me at one point and I asked the little girl her name. It was Callie. What do you guys make of this? Because I was super spooked. I get goosebumps just thinking about it now. I was living in a house that was the model house before we bought it. So no one had lived in it prior to us. I was married to a man that I still feel today had a lot of dark energy around him. While in this marital home, one night I was doing laundry. The laundry room was right off the living room. The door was wide open and the only light on was the laundry room light, which lit up the couches. I heard my husband say my name, so I looked up. There he was sitting on the couch, but faced away from me. He had on a red baseball cap, which I thought was odd because I never see him wearing caps. I responded by saying, did you want to help me do the laundry? There was silence, so I repeated myself and I was met with silence again. Annoyed, I said, okay, then just ignore me, you weirdo. I suddenly felt this evil energy, so I grabbed the towels I folded and walked quickly to our bedroom towards the bathroom, and saw my husband in bed asleep. He was out completely. Besides, if that was him and he was playing a joke, there's no way he could have gotten past me, especially that fast. Weird things kept happening in our house. We had major electrical issues that would get fixed only to go bad again. Our air conditioning units both kept perishing, then fixed, then perish again. Phones would never work. Our marriage was awful and my husband was very abusive. I felt this dark energy all the time. There was a door I would shut that would open the second I turn around. Nothing was wrong with it. Our master bath shower would come on full blast at 3am on random nights and always the same time. One day, a frozen food delivery service was in our neighborhood. The man rings the doorbell and asks me if I want to buy anything from them. I politely decline and he says to me, you know, if you ever need anyone to talk to about what's going on inside your home, you can always call my wife. Uh, come again, I made no mention of this. I didn't know what to say and was shocked. How do you know anything about my house? I say. The chills came over me, every inch of my body, in front of my eyes, as if the sun rapidly set and the sky became dark. I was feeling this fight or flight, and I was starting to close the door a bit more. I looked at him, and the man's face changed into a distorted one. His ears looked pointy, and he looked so completely evil. I slammed the door, locked it, packed a bag, and as soon as he was gone, I grabbed my kids and went to my parents' house for the week. This disturbed me so greatly that I haven't talked about it in years. I don't know what your beliefs are, 
but this changed my entire outlook on life as I knew it. I'm not crazy, I know this happened. I've had many things happen to me since, including a visit from a loved one, and I a million percent believe there are different levels of energy in this world. When I was little, I used to have an imaginary friend named George who lived in my house with me. Of course, my parents shrugged it off because what kind of toddler doesn't have an imaginary friend at some point? One day me and George were playing and all of a sudden I started choking badly. My parents come rushing into the room, freaking out, thinking I'm choking on something. But as soon as they walk in, I stop. I'm struggling for breath and crying. And I tell them that George was angry and that I would not do something he wanted. I can't remember what it was. But ever since that day, George was no longer a part of my life. Me being 24 now, I don't really scare that easy from paranormal type stuff. But it seems to always happen. Not too long ago, I was watching some ghostly show on TV. No one was home. And out of nowhere, the dustpan literally flew off the dryer in the room on the other side of the house and landed 10 feet away from where I was originally sitting. Now I've seen stuff throughout my life and I also deal with sleep paralysis from time to time. But a big part of me wonders if George is still lurking around and is just salty that I don't speak with him anymore. My grandma knows about George, but no one's ever told her about him. What do you guys think? I was never really a believer in the paranormal, and I'm not scared easily, as I was a professional MMA fighter for over 12 years. After this experience, I believe there are things we cannot explain. I may have opened the door and invited these things in when I was in a bad spot in my life with severe depression and listening to these stories. I'm in a much better place in my life now and have had no instances of anything since moving out of that house. It started off rather small, coming home with all my pictures off the wall. Crazy things would be that none of them would be broken as they were all made of glass, oddly enough. There was another time when I had a jug of water in the middle of the bed, and when I shut the cabinet in the bathroom next door, I heard a bang. I shut the cabinet a few times to make sure that I wasn't imagining things, and proceeded to go into my bedroom, only to find the jug of water in the middle of the floor. It got bad enough when my dog, a Siberian Husky called Blizzard, refused to enter my room. She would whine and cry when she was in the room no matter what time of day. It came to a head, and this is immediately what I wrote after the instance to my mother. Little backstory. I had just gone through a really tough breakup. 9.5 years to be exact. I moved in with two Filipinos and have been here for three weeks. So the guy who owns the house, the brother used to live in the room. Apparently he's always been followed by an evil entity since he was a kid. Apparently, an evil witch doctor put a curse on the family because he was upset with the uncle. The best way to get to someone is through their family. So he put an evil entity on the nephew. So, the one night I'm drifting away and listening to my stories that I used to fall asleep to, and I think I'm about to sleep or whatever, but can still hear my story perfectly. And I notice my door is open, and I'm almost sure I shut it, because Blizzard always sleeps in the hallway now. I get up to check. Mind you, I'm asleep or almost there, thinking, it was like an almost out of body experience. So I look out into the hall and see nothing. No blizzy. Even when she leaves my room, she usually sleeps in the hall. Here I am trying to shut the door and it won't latch and is almost bending out into the hall. Finally, I'm like, whatever. 
When I turn around, I notice Blizzy is sleeping on her spot on my floor by the hamper, but a blank entity is hovering over my bed. It doesn't really have a shape, but more looks like a dark black cloud. I kind of stare at it and I'm in shock. Instead of cowering, I make the decision to charge it. I really wanted to get a hold of it. As soon as I get to it, I'm back in my body, but I can't move. Mind you, I can still hear the stories word for word. It's at this point I can only wiggle my toes and fingers. Sleep paralysis, I tell myself. And try to wake up, which I do immediately. I'm not drowsy and I'm completely coherent. I look down, and Blizzy is in the exact same spot from where I saw her before I charged the entity. This happened last week, and I told one person. Somehow we got on the subject last night about ghosts, and I told them the story. Mouths drop open, and they tell me about the owner's brother. Apparently my roommate had a similar experience when he had sleep paralysis and the same object was hovering over him, and he had to tell himself to wake up. I'm pretty pissed they never told me about this when I moved in there, as there were two rooms to move into potentially. My theory is the entity got lost, and is trying to reattach itself to the brother but can't find him in Hawaii. The good thing is by not cowering and coming ahead on towards it, I showed it I wasn't afraid. Everything I know is that an evil entity attaches itself to people when they think they're weak or vulnerable. My mother spoke to her priest and warned her of what I was expecting. He told me to sage the room, say the Lord's Prayer and leave. I did that, and since then I had one experience, around 3am, I woke up to my entertainment centre collapsing. Wouldn't you know who comes running up the steps? The brother the spirit was looking for, unbeknownst to me, he was on leave from Hawaii and was staying with us for the night. I've had no instances since then, and have recently moved to North Carolina, where since life has returned to normal. I had an imaginary friend. Her name was Emily. She had long blonde hair and her face was half gone. She told me her mum passed away when she was very young and her father got very sad and took his life. And she never told me how she passed, just that her dad did it. One day we were playing outside in my mum's garden and my mum yells that it's time for dinner. So I go in as usual, but ask if my friend Emily can join as she was a friend, and never told me she wasn't real. So she said yes, and that we can share a plate. After eating, we go outside for a walk, and my mum always liked to get to know the people around. Now there weren't many kids in the neighbourhood at the time, so I was usually by myself. Well, while my mum was talking, the older woman saw me and said, it's great to see more kids around here. We haven't seen much since the accident. Well, my mum got to wondering and asked, what happened? So the older woman said that there was a little girl who used to live here called Emily. She lived with both her parents until her mother died, and Emily was the sweetest child you could ever meet. She said that she was around my age when she passed. Well, flash forward. She's talking about the mother passing and how the father became an alcoholic and started to get heavily into drugs. I guess no one found out until they passed. That's when I told my mum about Emily, the one I've been hanging out with, and said something along the lines of, that's the exact same thing my friend told me. And my mum gave me a look and asked what I meant by that. So I told her that Emily told me that her dad had ended her life and then proceeded to end his own. The lady gave us a weird look. That happened to be the day I found out how she passed. Her father beat her with a hammer, and that's why her face looked like that. And after that day, it was the last time I ever thought or saw her until now. I had a dream last night of her, and she was with my little brother. I woke up so fast and ran upstairs, only to find my brother talking to someone on the couch, but no one was even there. Then today is when he started to talk about her to me. I told him everything, 
and now I don't know what's going to happen. I was 13 years old. We lived in Lowell, Indiana. Our house was built in the 1800s, antebellum style, and huge. It always creeped me out. From the very day we moved in, I was aware that we weren't alone in that house. The house itself had seven bedrooms. I had three sisters and one brother, although we had plenty of rooms to have our own. We paired up. I shared a room with my older sister and my younger twin sisters had their room together. I will now share with you two of the most frightening experiences I had when I lived there. The first one before we decided that we would rather have a roommate than be alone. It was around the first month or so of us living there. I had trouble falling asleep to begin with, and it was summer, but I remember it being extremely cold in my room. So cold that I shivered and rolled onto my side to curl up under my blankets. Finally, I fell asleep, but I awoke and my skin was ice cold. My blanket was missing. I didn't think much of it, so I looked over to the right side of my bed on the floor, then to my left. Nothing. The hair stood up on the back of my neck as I crawled to the foot of my bed and saw my blanket laying perfectly flat like someone had taken it off me in the middle of the night and laid it out on the floor. Absolutely no wrinkles in it. I actually don't recall how I reacted. I just know that it creeped me out so much that I moved into my big sister's room on the second floor that very night. The second incident that really stood out and still does confuse me was we had a horseshoe driveway and a security light in our front yard. During the summers, we always kept our windows up as it stayed cool enough due to the light breeze and fresh air. One night, really late, the doorbell, which was extremely loud, rang. I got up and looked out the window down to my aunt Kathy, who was standing there with my cousins, Steve and Jessica. I could see them from their headlights and it was pouring rain like a monsoon, which I also saw thanks to the headlights. I yelled down, Hey, you guys okay? Yeah, can you let us in? She replied. Me and Keith are fighting again. Yeah, let me wake up my mum, I reply. So I wake her up, and she firmly says, as a matter of factly, Well, let them in. I ran around the banister down the 27 stairs to the foyer and opened the door. There was no one there. No car, no rain. Nothing. Just a warm breeze and the scaredest I've ever been in my entire life. I'm not sure if any of you know about these things, but can anyone explain what happened to me? I'm not the only one who witnessed it. My sister and my mum were both awake, and my sister was looking out the window as well as me. I always wondered what it was I let into my house. Like, what was it that rang the doorbell pretending to be a loved one in trouble? It's like... Whatever it was, knew that we'd open the door if someone we loved was in trouble. Insidious is how it felt. At the time, when I looked down from the second story window at my aunt, Kathy, cousin Stevie, and Kathy holding baby Jessica on her hips, Jessica wasn't born yet. But this is what shakes me too. I told my mum, Aunt Kathy, Stevie, and baby Jessica are here. At the time, Kathy was only three months pregnant. My older brother, four years old at the time, had just started preschool, and my younger brother had just been born. So I was left without a playmate, while my parents were focused on the new baby in the house. Like many kids at that age, I created an imaginary friend to entertain myself. At least, this was my parents' rationale. Over the next few months, my imaginary friend and I had become very close. We did nearly everything together. He would push me on the swings, I pulled out my chair for him at every meal, and we would sit in my bedroom and talk for hours. My parents couldn't believe how content I was to spend my days with my imaginary friend. My parents realized my friend was becoming a regular fixture in our lives, and they began to ask me questions about him, and I answered everything I could. What's your friend's name? His name is Uncle Louie. Where is Uncle Louie from? Pennsylvania. 
Is Uncle Louie always around? Yes, he follows me everywhere I go, except when he goes fishing. My parents were a little shocked when they heard the responses. My father had an uncle named Louie, who lived out on the lake in Pennsylvania, but he had passed away 10 years before I was born. My parents explained that it all felt strange, but they thought perhaps I had heard a conversation when he was mentioned and held on to a few of the major details. Not too much time passed before I made a comment to my mum that caused her to freeze with fear. Uncle Louis says he likes your necklace, mummy. My mother was always wearing a pearl necklace that Uncle Louis gave to her when she married my father 15 years earlier. There's no way I could have known. And she found this very unsettling, but convinced herself it must have been just a random comment from a three year old. Nearly a year had passed and I was preparing to enter preschool when my parents noticed that I hadn't mentioned Uncle Louie. I expressed no concern to them about him, but their curiosity got the best of them. One night they asked me what happened to Uncle Louie, and I told them that he drowned. Quite morbid for a three-year-old, but I, like all other three-year-olds, did not understand death. My mum was spooked by my comment. My dad was terrified. His uncle Louis suffered a pulmonary embolism, a blood vessel in his lung was clogged and burst, and he drowned in his own blood. I do not remember these experiences, and only in high school did my parents tell me these stories. My older brother also recalls me playing with Uncle Louis. At the time we shared a bedroom, and he said I would always make sure to close our door at night so Uncle Louis could get some sleep and open it in the morning for breakfast. I was told that my paternal grandparents had purchased the house they lived on in the 1960s, when their town was still heavily forested and less populated. Even then, it was no surprise that the surrounding areas, along with the land that the house stood on, were rife with spirits. Whether they belonged to the forest or among those people who had been killed in previous battles. To give you an idea on the layout of the house, I have to admit that it was a strange one, and probably already meant to bring bad luck. The front door was on the west side of the house, with a set of 13 steps leading to the upper floor that had two windows on the landing, one facing the east and the other north. On the right side of the landing, or a set of double doors leading to what might be considered the upstairs living room, with two bedrooms on the east side, and my grandmother's room on the west side. There were two concrete steps on the right side of the main door that led to the living room, and on the south side of the house stood a pair of sliding windows, and on the side door. The kitchen, which doubled as the dining room, was at the rear end of the house, with an outdoor cooking area, as well as an indoor cooking area, a sink, and the toilet was outside, as was the norm for many provincial houses in the Philippines. At the fact that there was a ballet tree just outside the back door from the kitchen, and a huge mango tree on the west side of the main gate to the house, along with an old grotto in the main yard, with an equally old statue of what was supposed to be the Virgin Mary to complete the creepy, depressing look of the place, not even flowers that I planted during my stay could cheer up the place. These details were important later. I hated the place as soon as I set my eyes on it, from the first time I was 12. The house was never filled with joy and laughter, but misery, jealousy, and negative energies. The wooden concrete walls practically oozed them, and I always felt like the life and strength were being drained from me when I was there. Looking back now, I don't know how I survived in that place for my first three years in high school, while having to endure the constant bullying I was subject to at the hands of my older sister and cousins along with several schoolmates. There were also two separate years when I was unemployed, and had to put up with my control freak father and delusional grandmother. Many strange occurrences took place in that house before, and after those residing there decided to leave. 
I should mention that the people on both sides of my parents' family have had some connection with the paranormal. My older sister is able to see spirits, while I can only see them through my peripheral vision. But anyway, on to the story. This took place in early 2013 after I was forced to resign from my job due to my health. In mid 2014 when I was able to finally leave that house and work in the city six hours away. By then the house was falling into disrepair. And it was only my father and myself living there since my grandfather passed in 2005 and grandmother in 2012. Since I was and still am mostly a loner, I was only close to a few people. But the cats and dogs in the area, whether stray or belong to someone, or even some farm animals who like to wander around, had a habit of coming over and later becoming close to me. No matter the time of day, I would always notice figures from the corner of my eye watching me, sometimes just standing there, even if there were no sounds accompanying their movements. The figures weren't only human, they'd also be animals as well. My cousin's dog Sheena was considered by many a pretty wild and unpredictable animal because of the way she walked, leant slightly to the side, and she had an accident while she was a puppy. As a result, her bones never set properly. Sheena had initially watched me from afar following my arrival, but warmed up to me about a week after. She often came to the house and would dive a few feet away from me until I was done with my task before strolling over, lying down, and I'd give her a scratch behind her ears or give her a belly rub while I was reading. And my bond with her and the other animals who came to the house was something that made living in that place a little bit more bearable. After the news about her being butchered reached me, I was heartbroken and couldn't stop crying as I loved her very much. A few days later after the news, I was in the living room sweeping the floor while my father was at a friend's house when I saw Sheena from the corner of my eye, standing a few feet away watching me. I dared not look in case she vanished and called her name softly and I saw her wag her tail and knew that she was saying goodbye. Not long after that, I noticed a little boy who seemed to be between two to four years, always following me around just standing a few feet away, watching. Once at around 6pm I was upstairs folding clothes. I had taken them from the clothesline and I noticed him standing in the doorway. I didn't feel threatened by him and spoke to him gently before I felt him leave. Later that night I was jolted awake by my father yelling in surprise and fear. Annoyed, tired and still very sleepy, I asked him why he was shouting at 2am which I saw was the time on the wall clock. He told me he'd gone to take a leak and he returned to the bedroom that we were sharing and he saw a little toddler laying beside me under my blanket on the bed. When he had clearly seen that I was the only one there a few minutes prior. This troubled me, for up till then, I had never told him of the little phantom child that followed me around. The next day I told my cousins Susan, Layla and Amy who were among the few people I am close to. Amy was clearly freaked out, but she, Susan and Layla told me that it had been an open secret that Vanessa, one of my estranged cousins, often went to the ancestral house to abort her children, who were the results of extramarital affairs she was engaged in. They weren't sure how many abortions she's had over the years, but the child I encountered, along with some of the others I have seen, may have just been them. I felt a wave of sorrow and anger for the children whose lives had been ended before they'd even begun, and told my father what I'd learned when I got back to the house. From that time on, I lit a candle and prayed for the young boy, along with the others who had passed. My father had a priest come to bless the house so that the spirits may find rest, but the boy stayed with me until the day Leela, Amy and I left that place to make lives for ourselves elsewhere. My father passed in 2016, and when I went to the house the day after the funeral, I found that it was falling apart. The plants I had painstakingly raised during my time there had withered in my absence. I didn't see the little boy or any of the other spirits in the house, and I pray that they have found peace. 
The house that drained the life from me and was filled with bad memories is now in ruins, with only the walls standing. But there's nothing left anymore. My daughter is three years old, and we are already seeing that she has intuition. She has said the time correctly down to the minute, and has known when people have gifts for her, who's at the door without anyone seeing or saying anything. And this really freaked me out. I grew up in a haunted house, and had an imaginary friend that I now assume is the ghost that haunted my childhood home. My grandparents still live there, and my daughter and myself went over to visit yesterday. Everything was going normal, until she looked up the stairs. She was staring at a corner, and started waving and smiling. I asked her what she was seeing, and she said the name, Sarah. I have never mentioned this around her, or her mother, so there's no way she would have known about Sarah. I asked what Sarah looked like, and she explained perfectly what I remember. Eight year old girl, blonde hair, green eyes, black dress. I'd been freaking out for over 24 hours about this. And I don't know if we can go back there. And I can try and smudge the house. I was around three or four when I met Sarah. I was a lonely kid. I didn't have any friends, just me and my dog. The house I grew up in was behind my grandparents. And the only time I ever saw Sarah was in their house. She was a mischievous little kid, and would play pranks on people, move their stuff and open cabinets, etc. When my cousins would come over, she would get really angry. I remember we would be playing and Sarah would be standing in the same corner just staring at me. She was a lot meaner to my cousins, and she would scare them when I went to sleep. I would always have to apologize to get her to play with me again. After I moved, when I would come visit, I never saw her again. But I would hear her footsteps upstairs and see things moving. The other ghost was one that everyone knew about. It was a six or seven foot shadow with red eyes. Myself, my brother and my cousins have all seen it. It moves hunched over like a humpback. When you see it, you know it's stalking. We would wake up and it would be standing over us and we would have scratches all around our body. It would run and hide in one of the rooms that we never went in. The room had eight porcelain dolls, and they would be rearranged. This ghost for sure is still in the house, because I moved back in when I was 20, and it would still mess with me. How did my daughter know the name of my imaginary friend? Unless, of course, she's a bit more than imaginary, and could see her too. Let me preface this by saying that I have lived in my house for two years now, and haven't had a single paranormal experience, no strange noises, no catching things out of the corner of my eye, absolutely nothing. My house is 124 years old, and I haven't felt so much as a single hair stand up when I walk around. This morning I was in my bathroom brushing my teeth, with the bathroom door wide open, when I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. I turned my head, and saw there was a woman who appeared from the waist up only. She had turn of the century clothing on, and she was wearing a bonnet with curly hair coming out of it. She wasn't exactly solid. She looked like she was shimmering, like how you see heat come off hot asphalt on first summer's day. I froze instantly, my mouth went completely dry, and I watched her float past my bathroom door into the guest bedroom. I don't know how long I held my position just staring into the hallway. I listened for some type of noise, but I didn't hear a thing. When the initial shock wore off, I went out into the hall and looked into my guest room, but there was nothing there. I know what I saw, 
and it caught me completely off guard as I've never experienced anything like this before. I did believe in ghosts before all of this, but now I know without a doubt, it's a real phenomenon. When I was a kid from ages three to five, I had an imaginary friend called Tom, who was older than me by a few years. I was the only one of my siblings to ever have an imaginary friend. Something that was strange about Tom was that he was always dying and then coming back to life in strange ways. One time from eating peanut butter when he was allergic. Another was when he jumped on someone's trampoline Maybe I was just obsessed with soap opera storylines as a child, but this is what I've always thought. I recently found out that before having my older sister, and then my brother and I, my mum had a miscarriage. I use the term miscarriage lightly because she didn't even know she had been pregnant until having a heavier than normal period. And when she went in for more fertility checks, they let her know she'd miscarried coincidence, right? I'm not 100% sure. And I was often adamant that he was not in fact imaginary. But just the fact that I was a kid and kids do weird stuff. I always maintained that he told me everything about him even down to his name. This comes in because Tom was the name my mother always wanted to call her son if she ever did have one. Although my brother's name isn't Tom. And Tom always perished very suddenly, and took maybe a few weeks for him to come back, so to speak. The more I think about it, I've always been super intrigued by the idea of ghosts. Way more than any other of my siblings, or anyone in the whole extended family. And have often had a feeling that I wasn't alone, when I was the only person in the house. Maybe this interest slash predisposition came from being friends with a ghost as a child. And could that ghost slash imaginary friend have been my miscarried older sibling? I have lived in a small English town in Yorkshire for the entirety of my life. The same home from birth till 26. Now. I live with my mother and younger brother of 15. We've always been an open family with each other, never shy to talk about feelings or anything of the sort. We live in a three bedroom semi detached home. I'm in the attic and have been since my brother was born when I was 11. My brother's bedroom door is directly opposite my spiraling staircase and mother's is across the landing at the front of the home. So our landing is a sort of L shape with five doors in various places around it. We don't need to have these specifics as they aren't really that important. We have always been quite in tune with otherworldly happenings apart from my brother, who maybe didn't want to admit to anything happening out of fear. Possibly, I wouldn't want to believe at that age either. But as for my mum and I, We've always said that we feel things in the house, whether it be a cool breeze, or in some of the most bizarre cases, gifts. This brings me to the first case in our house. I was around 14 and my brother four at the time. And me and my dad, who passed away five years ago, were in the main bedroom while my brother was playing in his. And we hear him talking as best a toddler can. We stood and listened out of view. After he stopped, my dad walked in and asked who he was talking to. So he replied, the nice white lady. This led me to ask my dad a volley of questions. What does he mean? What lady? Was it a joke on me? He then decided to give me a full overview of the things that had happened in the 31 years of him living in that house, always referring to the ghost as she. I got to a point where I wish I'd never asked. We went downstairs and the excitement was overwhelming to hear his stories, or so I thought. The first being long before I was born. Dad was downstairs washing the pots, my mum in the bath reading a book, as she still frequently does, and she heard my dad walking over the landing. Until she caught sight of 
Not my dad, but the lower half of a slender dress drifting past the door slowly, almost gracefully, and through the wall into the neighbors. Mom obviously freaked out, screaming for my dad, who ran upstairs thinking she had hurt herself, only to find her as white as a sheet. My dad always says he could feel when she was near, which used to scare the living daylights out of me, watching the hairs on his arms stand on end. I never doubted him in many things, but in ways I still wanted some proof for myself. The next story was when they first moved into the house. My dad was working on fixing up some old dressing tables in the attic. Mom was downstairs in the garden and it was summer, and she likes to try and tan, if you can do such a thing in England. While he was busy varnishing the table, he turned to the other table and noticed a small bunch of what looks like dried out brown flowers, no bigger than the palm of your hand. With seeing this, he bolted for the stairs and stood inches from my mum, to which she asked, what's wrong with you? He asked if she had been upstairs at all, to which she replied, no. He held the flowers out to her and she knew straight away they weren't a joke. They're kept inside a Bible that she has always kept in her drawer. Now, four years ago, me being the one in the attic, one day I was cleaning the bedroom, as normal. After vacuuming, I noticed something on the floor. Nothing could be in that spot, as I have hoovered meticulously. When I pick it up, I realized I'd seen the exact same thing before, another bunch of dried up brown flowers tightly bundled together. Without question, maybe less freaking out than my dad, I passed them to my mum, who placed them in the Bible along with the others. I have read before that angels can often leave flowers or white feathers, but dead flowers, that I can't seem to understand. Many times, Dad told me of things that happened to our ghost friends, from her stroking his hair ever so gently while he drifted off to sleep, to passing through the living room each night at 10, to things going missing, and then weeks or even months later magically reappearing in spots where they wouldn't be left to begin with. Sometimes when the house is quiet, you can hear footsteps from one side of the main bedroom to the door on the landing, never knowing when anyone else in the house and never during the same time. I know every sound of the house, from the pipes to the creaky top steps of the stairs. Hearing the footsteps aren't new either, this has happened for as long as I can remember, but something that you get used to over time. Sometimes I would feel the odd feeling when I was in bed of someone sitting on the bed. To begin with, I was paralyzed with fear, not knowing if I was actually feeling this happen or imagining it. My mum had a medium slash psychic come to the house. As soon as she walked in, she commented on how strong the presence was that she could feel, but it wasn't a dark energy, it was light, which I have begun to come to terms with. For me, this was confirmation all along that the others, let's call odd occurrences, were real. Until as I previously said, when my dad passed away, there was an energy that seemed to stay in the house. Now I'm almost certain she is warming to me more. I also feel my hair move on a night, trust me. I've tried to stay still when this is happening to see if it's me moving, but to no avail. It's like you can feel each finger run through your hair, and it gives me chills just thinking about it. Even when the house is warm, I can walk through certain parts and feel a chill, a freezing cold chill, and walk by the same area again and it will be gone. Nothing has happened to hurt my family, but it still isn't convincing to think someone could easily be watching my every move beyond the veil. And what's to stop not so nice presences from coming for a visit too? The first real paranormal experience I had was when I was 24 years old and the year was 2002. My husband and I we're living in a rental house that we moved into in late October of 2001. The house always gave me that weird feeling that I was being watched. 
I was working a part time job four hours a day, Monday through Friday, and I would get off work around 1.30 pm. My husband worked a full time position with his hours all over the place. You could say that I was home alone a lot. We had a German Shepherd chocolate Labrador mix named Bear Claw. He was a smart dog and very happy and always by my husband or my side. Let me explain the layout of the house before I continue with the story. When you walk into the living room, there was a bedroom off to the left. Straight ahead is the dining room. The second bedroom is also to the left in the dining room. And we had a Jack and Jill bathroom between the two bedrooms. Off the dining room is the kitchen and through the kitchen was a family room with a sliding door and to the backyard and a half bath. The whole house was a hardwood floor with a crawl space underneath the house. There were no carpets in the house except for the family room. So you had to walk across the floor and you can hear footsteps and the floor would creak because it's uneven. Bearclaw loved being outside, but when he was in the house, he would never leave the family room. Bearclaw would stand at the doorway watching me in the living room and cry when I was alone in the house, but he wouldn't cry when my husband was there. I had a hard time walking through the kitchen. The air was heavy in there and my skin would crawl. It got to the point that when my husband left for work, I would walk to my mother's and father's house, which was three blocks away. Skipping to March 2002. It was late. My husband and I were asleep in a full size bed. It was small and cramped, but my husband and I loved to cuddle. So we were okay with it. It's also essential to know that we had no bed frame. So the box spring and mattress sat on the floor. We had a duck lamp that gave off a strange orange glow that I used for a nightlight because I've always been afraid of the dark. It was a hot night and I could not sleep because of the heat. I would take my blanket off too to cool down, but then it got too cold. So I covered it back up. It was too hot to cuddle. My husband and I were both lying on our backs, shoulder to shoulder, him fast asleep, which I found odd as my husband does not take heat well. I finally got to the point that I just stuck my left foot out and handed over the covers and hung them on both ends of the bed. My body temperature was just starting to stabilize and I felt I could finally go to sleep. I closed my eyes and as I do, I hear someone step into the room with a loud creak sound. My heart jumped to my throat. I tried to open my eyes to see who came into the room and to my surprise, I couldn't open them. I didn't understand what was going on. Just then, I felt a large skinny cold hand grabbed my ankle and then my wrist. I went to yell for my husband, but I could only scream in my head. My heart was beating faster and I was being pulled off the bed. I then went to grab my left wrist and whoever had a hold of it, but I couldn't move my arm. I kept trying to call for my husband and trying to move my right hand. And finally, my right hand moved and grabbed my left wrist. But there was no one grabbing me. Then my eyes pop open and there was no one there. And I was partially off the bed. I crawled back onto the bed and under the covers. I got so close to my husband that I'm nearly laying on him, but I was so scared I didn't go to sleep till the next morning sun shined through the bedroom windows. When I finally got up next day, I told my husband what happened to me. He said that he thought he felt me being pulled away slowly, like from him, like I was being dragged. Then he felt me put my arm around him. In the following weeks, I found a thing called sleep paralysis. You know, that frightening state that a person finds themselves in when they're unable to move. It's due to an irregularity in passing between sleep stages and wakefulness. I then asked him how this could be sleep paralysis. If I found myself partially pulled off the bed, I could still feel the hands around my wrists and ankles the following next few days. He pulled out a book about supernatural creatures and read me one about a beast called the night hag or the old hag. A short explanation is a supernatural creature that's used to explain sleep paralysis. The phenomenon happens to a sleeping person who's on their back. The person feels a presence and the person can't move and then they feel the person sitting on their chest and they can't breathe or they feel the creature sit on the foot of the bed. I don't know if that was it, 
but I know that it wasn't sleep paralysis. Since that day, I've seen and heard things that others can't. A few weeks after that night, I found out I was pregnant with our first child. I thought just maybe whatever it was, wanted my unborn baby. To this day, when I think about that night, I can still feel two large, thin, cold hands on my wrists and ankles, like it's a mark that was given to me that opens the doors to the supernatural. I just wish I could give it back. I worked at a summer camp with young children. The camp is divided into two age groups, and I work with the younger group, ranging approximately from ages six to nine. Today, there was this one nine-year-old girl called Jane, who needed to sit out because she was upset, as this boy was picking on her. She was crying, saying that it was too hard being human. Weird for a kid, but kids say weird stuff all the time. When I, with the help of a few other staff members, managed to calm her down a bit and get her to stop crying, she sat quietly but still seemed antsy, like there was something else she needed to get out. After a bit of pressing, my coworker got her to start talking about her friend Lola. She said that Lola is a ghost and that she met at a different summer camp when she was three. One of my co-workers asked how she met Lola, and she said that these boys were picking on her, and she heard a voice whisper the words, Defend yourself, before an invisible force pushed them. Since then, she explained to us that sometimes she hears Lola, just a voice, and sometimes she sees her, either as just a passing shadowy figure, or a full person. She said that Lola later gave her advice about bullies, saying to use her words first, but if they hurt her, to hurt them. She then offered to prove Lola's existence. Naturally, I was curious, so she told me that she could get Lola to raise my arms. I agreed to it, and she had me stand up and close my eyes. She then did this weird thing, and had me say a chant, causing me to feel my hands, holding my wrists and guide them upwards. She then told me to open my eyes, whenever I wanted it to stop. I kept them closed for a bit, but then she told Lola to stop, and I felt hands letting go of me. She later told me that sometimes Lola goes too far. She said that sometimes, when she asks her to stop doing things, she's stubborn and reluctant to agree. She told me that Lola follows her around to protect her, and took a while to reveal her name. Jane said that she asked Lola why she was following her, and Lola said it was to protect her. She says she asked why, and Lola replied that it was because she's such a nice girl. I took her into the office to have a breather for a different reason, and she asked me if she could draw. I said yes, and she drew three pictures. The first two were normal, a cat and a jack-o'-lantern. The third was of a little girl with what looked like cat ears and a tail. I assumed that one was normal too, until she told me it was Lola. She told me that Lola was 12 years old and part wolf. This made me assume that Lola was probably just an imaginary friend, and that the thing she did earlier was some psychological trick she learned either online or from some kid on the playground. When we were walking back, she told me about how Lola once held her snake up in midair. She couldn't see Lola, just her pet snake levitating. And when she called out to Lola, telling her to put him down, she took a moment, but eventually did as she was told. While I'm not a skeptic, kids often do have very wild imaginations. So I kind of feel like Lola's an imaginary friend, conjured to help her through being bullied. But I don't know, could there be more to it? Could aspects of Lola be rooted in more than just a child's imagination? Are there any parts of the description of Lola that could be linked to any myths or legends? Let me know what you think. My sweet little grandparents are essentially my parents. They raised me most of my life and gave me everything. My family is fairly international. 
and my grandparents would often take trips out of the US to go to visit various family members. I would go with them often when I was younger. But as I got older and they retired, they would occasionally go on trips without me while I was still in high school. On this occasion, they had left to go to the UK for two weeks. I was 17 at the time, and they deemed me old enough to stay home alone for the last week of school and first week of summer vacation. We lived in a nice house in the more suburban area of our city, in a gated community. The neighbors knew I would be alone and thus had emergency keys to our place as well as being on call if I should need anything. Our house had an alarm system, which was great at first and did help us feel very safe and secure as we slept or if we were away. Before they left, the alarm had been set off a few times in the night, but it was not only for the doors, but the windows as well. And I believe it even had a motion detector for the last room and kitchen areas, as none of us tended to wander into those areas at night when the alarm was set. A few times it went off, we couldn't tell what had tripped it, and concluded that maybe a bird had knocked into the window and set it off. None of us were particularly concerned about it. My grandparents left for their trip, and per the usual when they were gone, I would sleep in their bedroom as it was closer to the alarm pad, had a phone in the room for emergencies and was also closer to the laundry room, where we tucked our two small pups into sleep every night. It just made me feel more secure since I was still a little wary of being alone at night. The second night I was alone, the alarm was tripped at about 2am. It wasn't a school night, so I was up watching TV. But when it went off, nothing sounded like it had been broken or open. And the dogs weren't barking at all. So I stayed on the phone with the alarm company while I checked everything out. It was also a freakishly loud alarm. So the husband of one of my neighbors ran over and cleared the house with me. We concluded another bird had hit the window somewhere. So even though nothing was found, I reluctantly went back to bed and slept without incident. A week passed with no further issues. I had friends over the next Friday, a few days before my grandparents were sent to return. We swam indulged in a little wine and played rock band until the wee hours of the morning. I saw everyone off, cleaned the house until about 3am and passed out in bed. It should be noted that I slept with the bedroom door locked and all the lights off except in the foyer and entryway. I woke up in panic at around 4.30. The alarm is going off and the dogs were going absolutely bonkers behind the laundry room door. Most disturbingly, one of the lights in the master bathroom was turned on. I had a single glass of wine, and I knew I hadn't woken up to use the bathroom because I noticed just how badly I had to pee when this was all happening. It was odd too because the specific light had come on and we rarely used it. It lit up the big jacuzzi tub in the corner of the master bathroom and different from all the rest of the normal sized light switches on the panel. It was a small sideways switch underneath the rest. The alarm company called me. I was terrified this time. So I grabbed the phone and hid under the bed. They asked me if I was okay and relayed that the motion detectors in the living room were going off. Someone was inside the house. It seemed like hours went by, though it was mere minutes before I heard my neighbor unlocking the front door. He came in, found me and cleared the house with me. No one was inside and no one would have been able to get out while I waited by the front door. The rest of the doors were locked. No windows were open and nothing had been smashed. He even checked the attic, though it had a minimal crawl space and we would have heard the ladder creaking loudly as it had been pulled down and back up. So we knew no one hid there. I ended up spending the next few nights until my grandparents returned with the neighbors and their kids who I frequently babysat. After that night, I felt the strangest heaviness in the house for weeks. 
It was oppressive, and even my deeply religious grandparents noted how the feel of the house was just off. I never saw anything, never heard noises after that, but the house felt dark and heavy for weeks. To this day, the thought of that night still freaks me out. Eventually, the house seemed to return to normal, but I never felt comfortable alone there after dark again. I still wonder what was inside that house that night. This happened when I was roughly three to four years old. Me and my family had just moved into a new house after the rent on our old house became too high and my mother couldn't afford to pay it anymore. One day, about a week or so after moving in, as me and my mum were home alone, and my older sister was at school, my mum was in the kitchen making me lunch and doing the laundry when she heard me giggling and talking in my bedroom. She thought nothing of it, because it's fairly normal for kids to talk to themselves while playing with toys. When she bought me my lunch, she found me half laying under my bed, talking. She asked who I was talking to, and I emerged from under the bed and replied, I'm talking to my friend Rose. Can't you see her? She's under the bed. Now, my mum doesn't believe in the paranormal or anything, but this gave her the creeps. And she made me eat my lunch in the living room and told me to watch cartoons so she could keep an eye on me. Fast forward a few days, and my mum has a neighbour over for coffee, and I'm sitting on the floor playing with my toys. Somehow, the topic of Rose came up, and my mum was telling the neighbour about it, and the neighbour starts asking me questions about Rose, like what she looked like, what we spoke about, and so I answered. She's older than me. She's a teenager. She's got ginger hair and green eyes. She tells me about her mummy. Her mummy was bad. My mum will never forget the look on the neighbour's face. The neighbour then asked to talk with my mum privately, and it wasn't until recently that I found out what the neighbour had told her. It turned out that Rose wasn't just an imaginary friend. She was the ghost of a girl who had previously lived in the house. From what I've been told, Rose was a 16 year old girl who lived in the house with her mum about 10 years before we moved in. Her mum was an abusive alcoholic. And from what I've heard, that's why Rosemary chose to end her life at the play park across the street. She was sick of her abusive mother and overdosed on painkillers right across from the house. It still saddens me to think of her, because as someone who's been close to doing the same thing, as someone who's dealt with various forms of abuse, I feel her pain. And I just wish she had the support I had when I was in that dark place. About four years ago, my grandmother passed in her house. She passed of cancer, and it was a peaceful death. Then about four months after that, my step grandfather also passed away. This one was a bit more brutal. He had gone into a big depression after my grandmother had gone and stopped talking to the whole family except for one of my uncles, his son, and he was also the one who found him. My grandfather stopped taking all of his medications, which was terrible for him because he had hepatitis C, diabetes and a few other disorders. He was found on the floor in the hallway and had been there for about three days. There was blood everywhere and he was internally bleeding and he began to cough and throw up blood. After both of my grandparents were gone, my family took over the house. We renovated everything. We had to put new carpet in. The old carpet was torn out because my grandfather had hepatitis C and his blood went everywhere. When we first moved in, my mom and I liked to sleep in the living room on the couches because our rooms were being renovated. Also, the cable wasn't set up yet and neither was the internet and we could watch DVDs in the living room TV. We lived very far out in the woods near the Bohemian Grove, so we had to wait to get satellite internet. My mum and I would usually sleep out there at different times 
because my mum works graveyard shifts at a vet hospital. However, every time we slept out on the couches, something strange would happen. Almost every night, at 2.43, give or take a few minutes, I would wake up terrified, covered in sweat and breathing heavily, on the brink of tears. I knew I had woken up from a nightmare every time, but I never remembered them. This happened probably 20 times before I decided I was no longer going to fall asleep in the living room. So I slept in my bedroom. But the only thing that stopped was the waking up at the same time every night. The nightmares never stopped. I was constantly haunted by these nightmares. I've always had nightmares, but they never happened as often as they did when I moved into this house. One night while my mum was off work, she had asked me if I wanted to watch a movie with her in the living room. It was pretty late, and I knew I would fall asleep if I did watch the movie, so I said no. When she asked why, I explained to her, and she kind of looked shocked. She said she had been experiencing the same thing, but during the day, and sometimes at night when she was off work. It was the same time, during the day, and at night was 2.43 a.m. We were sort of relieved that we had both been experiencing this, but also sort of scared because we had no idea what was going on. One afternoon, while my mum was sleeping out in the living room, she felt someone punch her in the side. She woke up thinking it was my dad or my brother messing with her, and she lifted her head up and said, What's your problem? And no one was there. She walked all throughout the house, and not a single person was there. It couldn't have been one of our dogs. She felt a distinct human hand hitting her in the ribs. So basically, my mum decides to never sleep on the couch again. Three years have passed since then, and we never did sleep on that couch during that period, and nothing really bothered us again, except for the nightmares that persisted. My boyfriend, who has been with me for over five years, even says that I've had more nightmares in this house than before we moved in. But about a month ago, my dad came home with a huge 4K TV. So of course, being the big movie buffs we are, my mum and I wanted to watch movies on there. Now, when I was watching movies out in the living room late at night, I usually stay up past 2.43 AM just in case and nothing will happen. Except the other night, at exactly 2.43, I was awake and my mum had passed out. All of a sudden, I start to hear a whimper. At first, I thought it was one of my dogs wanting to go outside, but then I realized it was my mum. And when the whimper grew louder, into a full scream, I woke her up, and she was very confused and scared. I told her she was screaming, and she said that she just had a dream where she was laying down next to me on the couch, like she was just then, but I was asleep. She said she was unable to move and was trying to scream because she felt I was in danger, but she couldn't get the words out. Then a shadowy hand grabbed my face, and that's when she woke. My mum and I are the only ones who experience the nightmare, and the specific times that the nightmares happen in the living room. Although when my older brother was crashing on our couch for a while, he claimed to have experienced some weird stuff too, like the feeling that someone was watching him sleep. We all have experienced things moving there on our own, like this antique kerosene lamp that we have on a shelf that just about touches the ceiling, flew off one day and shattered for no reason. It sucked getting the old kerosene smell out of the carpet. We've actually been losing forks as well. I don't know what that means, but they just go missing. And we're down to about three or four, as opposed to the 10 we started off with. Our TV will turn off randomly at times without anyone touching the remote. And we used a warranty to get a new one. And the new TV does exactly the same thing. It's not a power issue where the TV just loses power or the plug isn't plugged in all the way. The TV screen says powering off and then shuts down. We do get random scents out of nowhere. My mum usually smells this old soap that smells like her grandmother while I get a smell of something burning and it gives me a headache. My dad 
always smells something foul. These smells are unprompted. Usually only one person can smell it, and this has been slowly progressing over the course of the last four years. We're not really sure what's going on. I think it's my grandfather not happy that we're here. What do you guys think? When my little sister was between the ages of two to six, this was a long time ago, mind you, but she's 27 now. She had two imaginary friends, Madden and Jacob. She was two when she started talking about them in serious detail. Every girl in my family starts talking at a very young age, her younger than the rest of us, so believe me, she was detailed. She told us their hair colour, their skin colour, and what they liked to wear. Madden had pale skin and long blonde hair, while Jacob had brown skin with black hair and a red baseball cap. We had no idea where she got the name Madden from, it seemed kind of random. Nobody in the house played Madden football, and she stayed home with me and my mum until she began school. She talked about them more than she talked about anyone in the family. She talked to them all the time, until one day she just stopped. She started first grade, made some visible friends, and never mentioned Madden or Jacob again. We just chalked it up to childhood imagination. Well over 20 years later, I have a daughter. She began talking at one, and by 18 months was speaking like a pro. One day I was watching her jump on the bed. She was two. And I was standing there, and she looked at me and said, Mama, go downstairs, we won't fall off. So I said, Who won't fall? The five little monkeys? And she nonchalantly said, No, me, Jacob, and Madden. I was floored, but I immediately called my mum and sister to see if they had mentioned Madden or Jacob recently. They both replied saying that they had completely forgotten about them, and were all so weirded out. Even my super analytical engineer dad was like, whoa. I asked my daughter where she heard the names Madden and Jacob, and she simply said, they told me. Everyone I've told this to was like, oh, I'm sure one of you mentioned it to them when she was really little and you forgot all about it. But I know we didn't. As I said, we had all forgotten about my sister's imaginary friends. It isn't exactly a common topic of conversation, is it? Until my kid said she was jumping with them. She's only mentioned them twice since then. And it's been months since she did last. I think the story is nuts. What do you think? When I was little, about seven, whenever my dad was out of town for a business trip, I'd sleep in my parents' bed with my mum. This was one of those nights. Sometimes in the middle of the night, my mum would wake me up, saying that she heard someone in the house. It was only two of us and our dog. I listened, and I could hear a door slamming shut, opening and slamming shut again. The weird part was that it sounded like it was the same door over and over again. My mum called 911, while I silently cried in fear under the covers. I had never felt so much fear, and it was the first time in my life that I had been completely overwhelmed with panic. I also heard my dog going crazy out in the hallway. She was whimpering, and I could hear her collar jingle as she was running. I couldn't tell if she was running from something or chasing something. When the police arrived, the noises stopped. They searched the house, but found nothing. As soon as they left, me and my mum tried to go to sleep, but the door opening and closing started up again. My mum said she didn't want to call the police again. So I cried myself to sleep that night. When I woke up in the morning, it had stopped. There was nothing out of place. No open doors and no open windows. My mum doesn't like to talk about that night. For years after that day, I checked closets, under the beds and anywhere someone might be hiding. Whenever I walked into a room, to this day I can't sleep somewhere if the door isn't locked. 
I'm 18. And now I can never forget that night. I've always been angry at my mum for waking me up to experience the whole thing when I could have slept through it and completely avoided the trauma. I also can't help but wonder what would have happened if I'd have slept in my own room that night. This happened a few years ago, when my daughter was around four or five. I'll also mention that although I've never seen a ghost, I can always sense a presence, and whether it's good or bad. My daughter started talking about her friend Emily. I just put it down to her imagination, as she's creative, and always has been. Emily was mentioned a lot. Then one day I was home alone just having coffee and watching TV when I heard my daughter's toys going off, and they were all the sort that had to be pressed and pushed to make noise. She's monkey obsessed, and had a big pink monkey that made monkey noises when the middle is pressed, but it's difficult to press it right, if that makes sense. This monkey was one of those toys that went off, so I got up and walked to her room, and a couple of her other noisy toys were going off and flashing. The light on her small fish tank was on, even though I knew I'd turned it off. I lived in the UK at the time, and was on top up electricity and gas, and was a bit freaked out, but not overly due to our old house having some serious hauntings going on. That was more of a malicious feeling, and I didn't really feel that uneasy with this. I then noticed it was time to go pick up my daughter from school, so I switched off the light and left. On the way home, I thought I'd talk to her about Emily, and she started telling me lots of details. Like Emily was 18, she has long brown hair, her full name is Emily Rose Ward, and she died when she got sick, and she wears a long nightie. Ward is a fairly common surname, but my great grandma's surname was Ward, and she passed away shortly after my daughter was born. I knew she had two sisters, one of them was called Emily, who passed away of tuberculosis when she was 18. I'm now convinced she was my daughter's imaginary friend during this time. I've never told this story to anyone, as my family are very much, if you can't see it, feel it, or hear it, it doesn't exist, and my husband just mocks me about my belief in the paranormal. But I thought this might be worth sharing with all of you. There are a number of stories that I wish to share with you about the house I used to live in. I was home alone in the bath, but I had closed the door so that my dogs wouldn't run in and try to jump into the bath too, as they always did. I was there for a good 45 to 50 minutes, and when I climbed out and opened the door, there had been a table moved right in front of it, I never heard a thing while it was happening, never even heard my dogs bark, and they bark for anything, and they were playing outside, which was so strange for them. There was also a stage of about three to four weeks where my dogs would refuse to sleep in my house, they would rather sleep outside. Within that time, I would constantly feel like I was being watched, hearing people coughing, or sneezing outside my window. One morning, I awoke with a scratch on my face. Remember the dogs were all outside, as they were refusing to sleep inside with me. I woke up in the middle of the night once. I was partly asleep, partly awake. I needed to use the bathroom, but I couldn't get through the door. Something kept blocking me and pushing me back. I was physically pushed back to my bed, and I just remembered climbing back in. I woke up next morning, like thank goodness it was just a dream, got up, and realized I was on the wrong side of the bed, and I was filled with scratch marks down my arms and legs. Scared the ever-loving crap out of me. This one's more on a funny note. Every night at nine, the door would rattle, seriously, every night. Now my mum and her husband also picked up on this, and one night, my mum decides she's going to stand by the door and wait for the rattle sound of the door handle, 
so without her knowledge, her husband jumps through the bedroom window and runs to the front door and rattles it. I have never seen her run, glide and fly through the passage so fast, like I've never seen anyone so scared. I felt bad for her, but hey, cruel pranks. This other story is from my other house. I could honestly spend hours telling the stories of the crazy stuff from living there. Now this specific house is the house I grew up in. And the first time I ever saw something was when I was about seven. I had a playroom that was in the bottom part of the house. The house was set up in a way that it was just one long passage, six bedrooms in my toy room. That was the last bedroom at the end. Now, we never went to the bottom part of the house. I always thought it was because we never needed to. It's only later I found out the real reason. To get back to the story, one specific day I had something I didn't recognize come into my room and told me to start running. I just about crapped myself and ran to my mum. She immediately told me it was nothing and that it was probably my shadow and the TV in the background. Only when I was older, she admitted she'd actually seen it herself. I described exactly what I saw and never spoke of it again. Fast forward a few years later, my little cousin about five at the time comes running out of the same room screaming to her mum that a shadow told her to start running. Another incident, I would usually lay in the entertainment area and watch TV at the bottom of the passage. Only in the day though, nobody dared doing that at night. My back was towards the rest of the passage as I was laying on the couch. I was home alone at the time and we had tiles, so I hear footsteps walking towards me and naturally assumed it was my dad. So I didn't think anything of it until after a few seconds, I turn around and there was nobody there. There was another incident in the house I grew up in, like I've just said, but I wanted to point out that I've always had animals growing up, never just one or two in the same house. Maybe I'd have two dogs and three cats at one time. Now see, this is all perfectly normal until you realize that while having animals and living there, none of my animals would ever get to reach their first birthday. They would always die. I've lost so many animals in my lifetime. It still messes with me. They would all just pass away of illness and it would be so out of nowhere. One day they'd be happy and healthy and the next we'd find them. My mum and I still talk about it even though it's a touchy subject. We really loved all those animals and it was terrible. Every single person that knew that house completely believes that there was something wrong with it. Now for the part that most certainly can't be explained. There was a brief moment in living in the house where all my animals had passed and we had none. And I remember it like it were yesterday. I would literally still hear my animals running down my passage past my bedroom every night. Both my parents and absolutely anyone who came wouldn't be able to get past the third child's bedroom. They'd immediately get goosebumps. You could honestly feel someone watching you. You could feel the cold wind when there was no one there. You'd get goosebumps. The air would lighten up and you'd tense up. It was horrible. We ended up moving out of that house when I was 13. One day we went to visit the new owners of the house a few years later. I can't remember why exactly, but they actually asked if we'd ever experienced anything weird and strange in the house. I remember the intense conversations that night between the two families. The house I'm currently living in, I found out that the old woman that used to stay here was heavily into witchcraft and her husband passed away here. I had an imaginary friend. Her name was Emily. She had long blonde hair and her face was half gone. She told me her mum passed away when she was very young and her father got very sad and took his life. And she never told me how she passed, just that her dad did it. One day we were playing outside in my mum's garden and my mum yells that it's time for dinner. So I go in as usual, but ask if my friend Emily can join as she was a friend. 
and never told me she wasn't real. So she said yes and that we can share a plate. After eating, we go outside for a walk and my mum always liked to get to know the people around. Now there weren't many kids in the neighborhood at the time, so I was usually by myself. Well, while my mum was talking, the older woman saw me and said, it's great to see more kids around here. We haven't seen much since the accident. Well, my mum got to wondering and asked, what happened? So the older woman said that there was a little girl who used to live here called Emily. She lived with both her parents until her mother died. And Emily was the sweetest child you could ever meet. She said that she was around my age when she passed. Well, flash forward. She's talking about the mother passing and how the father became an alcoholic and started to get heavily into drugs. I guess no one found out until they passed. That's when I told my mum about Emily, the one I've been hanging out with and said something along the lines of, that's the exact same thing my friend told me. And my mum gave me a look and asked, what I meant by that. So I told her that Emily told me that her dad had ended her life and then proceeded to end his own. The lady gave us a weird look. That happened to be the day I found out how she passed. Her father beat her with a hammer. And that's why her face looked like that. And after that day, it was the last time I ever thought or saw her until now. I had a dream last night of her. And she was with my little brother. I woke up so fast and ran upstairs, only to find my brother talking to someone on the couch, but no one was even there. Then today is when he started to talk about her to me. I told him everything, and now I don't know what's gonna happen. Most days from seventh grade to senior year, when I walked home from school, I'd cut through a park. It has a track around it, which is just a two foot wide paved path. And on the other side, there's a church and a funeral home with their backs to the park. And on the other side, it's just woods. It was January of my sophomore year, and we'd had a warm winter, so no snow, but plenty of rain. That made the little paved path so covered in puddles, it was impossible not to splash. And the grass was so soggy, it made a squelching noise when you walked on it. No matter the weather or time of day, there's always at least one person jogging or something. I was part way down the path when I heard footsteps, like a man wearing heavy boots and a dog collar jingling very close behind me. I moved to the side so they could pass me, but no one did. I turned around and there was no one behind me. No one as far as you could see in any direction, not even any cars in the church or funeral parking lots. I thought that was weird, but I kept walking. I heard them behind me again as soon as I started up. So I stopped and turned around and the footsteps and jingling stopped. When I continued walking, so did it. This happened a few more times and I was starting to get nervous. And the fact that the person and dog were walking and didn't splash through any puddles was weirding me out. It was ankle deep water almost. They sounded so close too, like they were less than a foot behind me the whole time. Oddly enough, I didn't hear the dog's footsteps, just its collar. But after maybe the fourth time, I stopped. It sounded like the person had come to a stop right behind me. Then directly behind me, I heard a deep, low, unmistakable dog growl, which sounded like it was coming from maybe one and a half to two feet off the ground. Well, I didn't need to hear that twice, let me tell you. So I started running down the path, out the park, and the quarter of a mile home. I've never run so fast or run more than a few feet in my whole life, and I triple checked that the door was locked. I later realized that I'd first heard the man and dog when I was walking past the back of the funeral home. To this day, I'm unsure if that's of any significance. I had an imaginary friend, and his name was Nobody. He was just a shadow of a normal person, but five times the size of me. And it wasn't just me looking at my own shadow. He was someone I'd see and think about always distinctively opposite of my real shadow. And for as long as I was thinking about him in that imaginary friend phase, 
He represents thoughts that served as nothing but contrarian to anything I was thinking. Even if there were negative or malicious thoughts, the thoughts I'd have in response, that at the time I perceived as coming from him, were things like, no, that's stupid and childish, that's the wrong way, you'll have to wait till you're older, weird stuff like that. Sometimes I imagined him staying in places on the opposite side of my shadow, when I got used to it, and then he'd start moving and walking around me in a circle, tapping my own shadow in the head as he walked by and then coming back or moving closer. It was loopy. Most friends I have, if they even had imaginary friends, say that. It's quite creepy. When I was younger, I lived in this pretty old house in a neighborhood. It was always creaking as old houses tend to do. I've always felt uncomfortable and weird when I'm inside the house, even during the day, and tried to play outside as often as I could. I know I wasn't the only one who felt this weird, creepy vibe, because my mother once asked me to be there with her one night while she was cleaning the kitchen as she felt uncomfortable. This house gave off a lot of bad energy. My parents did not get along which resulted in a lot of arguments, which must have caused some trauma for me. I was so full of anxiety that I barely spoke to my parents and stuck to myself. Overall, a lot of bad vibes and energy. But in a more of a paranormal stance, there were also times when the TV would turn itself on or off. At some point when my dad was walking down the hallway, I saw a subtle glowing figure following behind him. I even remember falling down my bunk bed twice. And on the second fall, when I got up, I realized my head was somehow under the bed, as if I was being pulled under it. But the main thing that stuck out from living in this house was that I constantly had nightmares, specifically ones that were always held in parts of my house. I had nightmares where there was something in my closet that was trying to come out. And once I woke up, and noticed that my closet was slightly slid open. I had another dream where there was something coming out from under the bed, the shed that we had in the backyard that my dad built too. I knew there were three of them living there, since there were three lines that moved through the tall grass, and they were moving towards me. I'd always wake up in the middle of the night, and swore that a shadow had moved across my window at some point. Eleven years later, my family finally moved to another home, and stepping into that new house never felt so calming. No creepy feeling that something was home, and no nervousness when alone in the house. I could never imagine going back. But some years later, my mum had a friend that by some odd chance moved into that same house. My mum asked her if it ever felt weird inside the house, and even her friend agreed that she never felt comfortable while she was alone in there. Being an only child, I made up an imaginary friend called Joyce. She was another little girl that I spoke to, played with, and even went as far as making a birthday party for her. I never physically saw her or even spoke to me. My parents didn't really think much of it and just let me be. The first weird thing that started happening was every day after school, a little girl would always call asking me from different area codes. This was a landline phone. So when you left a voicemail, it would be played on speaker. Sometimes she would be angry, which my mum thought was weird, as when she would answer the little girl would hang up. My mum started noticing that these calls were from different states, and continued for about three months. Second was a string of weird things that happened. The neighbors always used to say they saw a little girl at my window when we were out or I was playing outside. They thought I had a sister and my mom would hear a lot of noise and footsteps. The scariest thing was when she came home and heard running upstairs and slammed doors. My mom immediately screamed because she thought someone had broken in. The police were called and no forced entry and nothing was found. We would take pictures and these people would appear. A bride with long black hair appeared walking past my dad on the couch. Another time these ladies came out sitting at the table. 
I could go on about the weird experiences, but the scariest one was when the little girl, or whatever the hell it was, called again. Since it was late, my dad thought it must have been a work call, and when he picked up it was a little girl crying asking for me. My dad got goosebumps, and he's a skeptic, I asked her what she wanted, and she wanted us to pray for her, and then it hung up. After that we went to church, and the next day a priest came to bless our home. Pretty much everything calmed down after that. Did I bring my childhood imaginary friend to life? My house is old. What is currently the kitchen, master bedroom, and dining room was the original portion of the house, built in the late 1800s, around the time the community was being established. The house has grown significantly since then, and my parents bought the house in 1991. After a few years, my mother started having very bad night terrors. They eventually escalated to the point where my mother felt she could no longer stay in the home, and we moved in 1999. My parents kept the home as a rent house, and I bought it off them in 2007. I was pretty much constantly rearranging the master bedroom, now my room, and after about a year, my bed ended up in the same position as my parents had theirs during our last years when we all lived here. I started having night terrors of a man in old-timey clothes sitting on the edge of the bed with a knife. They were so real that I started sleeping with the lights on. The light was the only difference between the dream and reality, and helped me pull myself out of it. This went on for a few months, until I moved the bed and they abruptly stopped. Later on that year, my night terrors came up in conversation with my mother. The look on her face was both recognition and pity. She described the man perfectly, then asked if my night terrors had developed into being buried alive. I said that they hadn't, and she said, yeah, I guess it took about a year and a half for it to get to that. Then I suddenly realized why my mother was so stressed out in those years, and why she hates to visit my home. After that, I began my best trying to research the area, the home, everything I could get my hands on. It wasn't until this last weekend, when at a music festival, an older gentleman asked me, wasn't there a civil war in that area? And gave me my first real lead. I learned that there was a battle in 1862, approximately three decades before the original portion of the house was built. About 60 miles north of here, in fact, and the troops likely passed through here on their way to the Gettysburg of the West. Still researching though, I have no concrete answers. Definitely do not miss the night terrors. Growing up in a very superstitious family, I was exposed to the paranormal fairly young. At the time of this experience, I was between four to six, and I'm now 15. Like most young children, I had imaginary friends. Now I don't remember much about the friends, so a lot of the details of them are things that I told my mum, and she later repeated back to me. These friends of mine, one was a boy and the other a girl, were dressed, as I know now, like someone from the early to mid 1800s. The way I described them to my mum was the little boy was wearing a white shirt with buttons, brown pants and straps on his shoulders. The little girl was wearing a long white dress, neither wore shoes, and their clothes had holes. Like most kids with imaginary friends, I would talk to them as if they were really there. So at first, my mum didn't really put much thought into it. Soon enough though, she began to think that there was more to this situation than she first believed. The first thing to set her off was when I started talking about the little boy's father. No big deal, right? Except for the fact that I was absolutely terrified of the boy's father as far as someone crying to my mum about him, after an incident with my brother seeing an entity attached to me. My mother called our preacher. She had him bless the house and myself, and after that I completely stopped seeing the children. I now have very little memory of them, 
I don't even remember what their names were, but my mum does. But she will not say them for fear of reattachment. When I was younger, I used to live in a condo. I had my own room while my parents' room was across from mine. Think of a T-shape with a room on either end of the top line. It would be relatively easy to see and hear someone in the other room. Now it was nighttime and I was asleep, but I woke up at what I assume was around midnight or maybe a few hours past. I'm not exactly sure. Now as a kid, I was never afraid of the dark per se, but wasn't too fond of it either. The thought of not being able to see what could be lurking close by and being that vulnerable always kind of freaked me out a bit, but I never believed in monsters in the closet or under the bed or anything like that. But I always just got creeped out by that dark, something of which I've now grown out of mostly. And of course, being the kid I was, waking up that late at night when it was that dark out, I hid under the safety of my blankets. And that's when it happened. I was lying on my side, still under the sheets, and I felt something poke me. It felt like someone just poked my side. That's it, nothing else, just that. Now I was a kid and it was late, but it was a very significant and noticeable feeling. Of course, immediately I threw off my sheets the second I felt that, and to my surprise, no one was there. I thought it might be one of my parents who sometimes got up late at night checking on me to see if I was asleep, as as a kid I liked staying up. I grabbed a late night snack from the fridge, ate that and went back to my room, pulling the covers over my head once more, and I even remember asking my parents the next day if they had come into my room and they both said, no. My family and I had just moved into a new house. This was right after the housing market went way up in the 2000s. So the house we were moving into was a dump, but it was all we could afford in our school district. You see, it had previously been a crack house. The windows were busted by police, fences taken down by SWAT, needles in the garbage disposal. It was a dump. My mum and stepdad were fixing it up before we finally moved in. My sister's dad would go over after work and paint it because everything was covered in graffiti. He got home one night and said, when I got to the house today, I saw a little kid. This was after they had already replaced the windows so nobody could break in. He said that he came into the house and he saw a little kid go from one bedroom into the master. So he went into the master bedroom and no one was there. At first he thought my mum had been there with my sister and had left someone there. When he realized we were not there, he didn't really know what happened. My mum just told him it was fumes and to open up a window and wear a mask. Keep in mind, my stepdad isn't the type of person to believe in ghosts or paranormal things, and he didn't get scared easy. So this wasn't out of character for him. Right after we moved in almost instantly, my sister had an imaginary friend called Whitehead, and this was unusual because she never played pretend. She never played with dolls or anything, and she was more of a computer Game Boy tech kind of person and still is today. She was always very logical and thought very scientifically, even though she was young at the time. It was just odd because she'd never had an imaginary friend before. My mum and I were always the more artsy wacky ones. Generally, when a child invents an imaginary friend, it's because they want someone to play with. But her imaginary friend was super annoying, and he was always bothering her. She would constantly complain about him, Mikey not sharing a toy, or wouldn't play this game, or he touched my juice. He's not following rules or taking turns. Who invents such an unobedient imaginary friend who you can fight with all day? One day my mum was out front talking with our neighbours and she was telling my mum that before these people before us, there was another family with kids. Then she asked if they ever saw anything weird in the house. She told my mum that they had seen stuff in the house and that her son, who was a teenager, when he was little had an imaginary friend called Mikey. The kids, 
that lived in our house before us also played with him, and she had seen him before. My sister and I would spend our weekends with our grandparents, and my mum would take the batteries out of all our toys because they would keep going off randomly when no one was in. I remember I had a piggy bank that made a noise when you put money in. One night it wouldn't stop. So I checked to see if it was jammed, but nothing was in it. So I ended up throwing it away because it wouldn't stop going off in the middle of the night. I had never had problems with sleeping before or after that house. But when we lived there, every morning I would wake up contorted in some way. I would wake up shoved in a little space between my bed and dresser in a ball. And I would always be stuck and my mum would have to help me out in the morning. I would always try to figure out how, but never could. I was in third to fourth grade at the time, and my mum had put guards on the side of my bed, but I would still end up contorted and shoved between the dresser. This never happened when I stayed with my grandparents. My mum worked a night job and would stay home during the day with my sister. One night she came home from work and was washing her hands in the kitchen. From the kitchen, you could see into the living room. My mum turned around because she could feel someone watching her. And for a split second, she saw a kid standing there. She said he looked around eight years old and in a flash, he was gone. Not too long after it was my sister's birthday. After the party, my sister and I went to my grandparents' house. My mum and stepdad were alone. My mum took all the balloons from the party and tied them together and put them in the corner of the living room. So they were watching TV. The air was off because the weather is nice. And all of a sudden, all of the balloon strings came together like someone grabbed them and they floated down about a foot. Then they went around the corner and really slowly down the hallway. Then once they got to the light in the hallway, the balloons went down and around the light. It went down to the end of the hallway and stopped at my sister's door. My mum and stepdad were watching in horror, not knowing what to do. So my mum shouts out, Hey Mikey, if you want those balloons, you can have them. Right when she said that, the balloons went into my sister's room. Now there used to be a Taco Bell by our house. This was before they started remodeling it. So it looked like a mission. My mum, my sister and I were driving past it. And my sister said, Mikey said that he used to live in a Taco Bell house. We didn't think anything of it. After we'd lived there for a while, my mum decided to look into the history of the property. Before, it had been a cattle ranch. She then learned that before that, right on the property where our house and three others were on, there was a children's mission. It was funded by the Catholic Church, and they had orphans. That's when it clicked. One year, my sister said, it's Mikey's birthday. We have to have a cake. So my mum made a cake and she then marked it with a little dot on the calendar. Then when she changed over the calendar the next year, she marked it with a dot again, just to see. And the following year on the exact same day, my sister says, it's Mikey's birthday today. He wants a cake. At Christmas time, my mum went out and bought him a Hot Wheel and a little toy horse. And a few days later, the horse disappeared. My sister didn't touch it, and I have no idea where it went. A few years later, when we were playing in the backyard, we found it buried in the yard. And we brought it back inside and put it on the coffee table. And that night, it went missing again, and we haven't seen it since. So I was a picky eater, still am, but my stepdad used to make me stay at the table till I ate all my food. I was also stubborn, so I'd sit there till 10 at night when he would finally just let me go to bed. But every night at that table, I would see a shadow walking around the hallway from room to room. I would just think I was seeing things, but it would happen almost every night. That's pretty much everything I remember. My mum, sister and I moved out after my mum and stepdad split up, and I haven't been back there since. My sister's dad still lives there, and she goes out there on weekends. She's in high school now, and she still tells me about the house and how it feels heavy, and how she sees the shadows. I hope that you have found the story somewhat interesting. My old house was basically a haunted house. 
Not even talking about weird stuff like opening for no reason, but actual ghosts that lived there. When I was young, about eight, I was asleep and woke up to take a leak. I was on my way to the toilet when there was this weird pulse of light at the corner of my eye. I looked to my left and less than 20 feet away from me was this lady in white sitting under our mango tree. She turned to me and to this day, I swear on my life, she didn't have a face. So I noped the hell out of there and back to bed, still not really understanding what was going on. Just thought that it was just a weird lady. I ended up waking my brother to ask him what was going on and asked, you see that too, right? To this day, my brother hates the fact that I ended up dragging him into his only ghost encounter in his life. From then on, the event must have triggered something for me because I'm a bit sensitive to that kind of stuff. And I've seen even more stuff in the house that still shakes me to this day. Our school also had an exchange program with Korea. I got along pretty well with the dude and he became one of my best mates for quite a while. So I invited him to hang over to my place and play some video games. And I remember when he entered my room, he kind of paced around for a bit and just stopped. He looked at me and gestured with his hands a bit and said, spirits. I was grateful that someone understood, at least partially. And I just kind of gave him a resigned nod and said, yes, yeah, spirits. After knowing and dealing with quite a lot, it was just nice to have a kindred spirit. It was getting late. The sun had been down for quite a while and he was gonna stay over the night. We're just chilling when I get this feeling that washed over me. Nothing cold or anything like the stories you read, but a feeling of wrongness, like your gut is telling you this is a bad idea and to get out, but like amped up to 10. So when my senses were blaring red alert, I felt my bed shift, like someone just sat on it. I froze up, and my dog that has basically been so lazy all day that's by my PS1 stands up and starts growling and barking at something behind me and my friend. I didn't look back, neither did my friend. My dog finally stopped five minutes later and was still agitated. Needless to say, me and my friend ended up playing Tekken 3 all the way to a morning and literally never looked back. He never came round again. Hey guys, it's Mort here. Thank you so much for listening. I usually don't end compilations with any more words, but I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who watched. Feel free to leave comments down below and stuff. And tomorrow I'll see you with a fresh video. So, you know, no old compiled stories. Nonetheless, these do take a very long time to make, so I hope you guys liked it. But for now, stay awesome and I'll see you in the next one.